Welcome back to Zero Books and Repeater Media. And today, myself and the Asset Horizon crew are thrilled to be joined by Professor Stephen Javiro to discuss the fabulous and fabulating world of science fiction. Stephen is a prolific philosopher and theorist, having written books on topics such as Deleuze, Blanchot, Bataille, speculative realism, network theory, and literary analysis, which will be our focus today. This includes not only 2010's post-cinematic affect for Zero, and of course 2016's award-winning Discognition for Repeater, a treatise on technology and speculative theories of consciousness which emanate from science fiction and the wider literature. We hope to carry that thread forward in our discussion today on futurity and possibility. And just to start off, Stephen, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. It's great to be here. I mean, I've been very happy publishing with both Zero and Repeater. And I cherish the memory of Mark Fisher, who was involved in the founding mm. of both. So, so to I start am. things off, <laughs> oh, sorry. Go ahead. So to start things off, uh, so what would you say would it be the limits of our contemporary sort of big theories of science fiction? You know, for example, the, the more dominant theories of that, like say, of someone like Darko Suvin, who defines it as cognitive estrangement. Where do you see the limits of how we typically understand what sci-fi is? Well, you know, th that can be answered in several ways. In one general sense, when you try to define like genres like science fiction, and you could say for fantasy or you could say naturalistic fiction for that matter, they're always, it's always a rough and ready definition rather than a totally rigorous one. And that's okay. I think it helps you orient yourself as long as you don't believe there's something which is too, you know, rigid. I mean, so any kind of time you define a genre of literature or film like science fiction, there'll be, there'll be things which are exceptions. There'll be things which are borderline cases. There'll be things which mix different genres together. And this is historically true in science fiction because science fiction and fantasy are pretty much joined at the hip. And yet you might think they have very different orientations. I mean, sort of, you know, futuristic technologies on one hand and, you know, battling orcs and, you know, stuff like that or the other don't necessarily go together very easily. But obviously they're, they're related because they're both related because they're imagining alternative realities and they're related because they're, um, they have a historical origin somewhat in common. I mean, what we think of as science fiction, so this is, I'm still not, I'm, I'll get to Dark with in a minute, but when you, think yeah, science, when you think of science fiction, I mean, it's, people can, you can call lots of things science fiction if you want. I think the ancient culture, I think Lucian was a Greek writer in 200 AD who wrote A Voyage to the Moon, and there's been all kinds of things like that. Mm. But what we think of as science fiction today really starts in the 19th century, and, that's, and fantasy also really starts in the 19th century. It's a way, it's a response to the Industrial Revolution to how things are changing technologically. Many people consider Frankenstein by Mary Shelley, which is like 1816 or 1818, something like that, as the first science fiction novel. And she didn't think science fiction wasn't a term that existed then. She didn't think of it as science fiction, but she was taking a type of literature which existed, which is like the Gothic romance, and giving it a more scientific mm -hmm. inflection by having it not be, you know, monsters and ghosts, but being a technological invention of an artificial human. And, you know, so it's something, it wasn't science fiction when she wrote it, but it is science fiction now. It's one of the founding works of science fiction now. So. You always have a kind of history of of the of these things and the history ch and things change. I mean, science fiction in the mid 20th century, when it's often called the golden age of science fiction, was very much sort of straight guy literature. Um, now it's very different. There's lots of gay, lesbian, queer, trans, etc. influence in thinking of different types of characters and different kind of lifestyles. What still makes something science fictional, I think, has to do with its attitude towards projecting technological advances and projecting futurity, a sense of what might happen in the future. So, so I mean, that's a very general definition. Um, obviously, again, there are mixtures of science fiction and fantasy, and a lot of recent mm. works are not necessarily all that technological-centered as traditional science fiction was. But it's kind of like, so, okay, so in terms of academia, Darko Subin, 
who's this guy originally from Yugoslavia, mm -hmm. but taught at McGill University in Montreal, um, sort of introduced ideas about science fiction to mainstream Anglo-American um, academic discourse. And he defined that mm -hmm. it's still very influential and you sort of, I mean, I really disagree with him, but you have to take him into account because he's just everywhere people try to think about these things. I don't think science fiction writers necessarily care very much about it, but people, <laughs> critics like myself who write about science fiction sort of have to. So he said science fiction was cognitive estrangement. Estrangement meaning that it was not naturalistic. It was not the world we know. It was an alternative world. And it estranged us. He was thinking of certain modernist ideas which came from Russian formalism and then later French linguistics in the early mid 20th century. Mm -hmm. Thinking of something which not only was different from what we accept as actuality, but which precisely estranges us from actuality in in ways that force us to think. He's thinking of Bertolt Brecht also in the early mid 20th century, who is a playwright who tried mm -hmm. to create a theater in which he didn't want audiences to identify with the characters and get totally into what was happening, but they wanted them to, the people watching the play to question, say, why is that character doing that? Aren't they being stupid? Aren't they just, you know, selling out and, you know, want us to be aware of uh, the ideological frames which surround both stories mm -hmm. and our everyday assumptions. Okay, so that's estrangement. Cognitive means having to do with conceptual, meaningful things. And Steuven is very, very strict as opposing it. He says he hates fantasy. He thinks fantasy is totally non-cognitive. You know, having the one ring and dwarves and elves and stuff like that for him is just, you know, mindless, irrational fan fantasizing. That's why it's fantasy. Mm -hmm. Whereas science fiction has a kind of intellectual content to it. So he tries to draw the line. Now, what have, you know, it's been a very useful rocket of definition, but what always happens when you try to draw a line is that certain things don't fit in easily. There's boundaries are, 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 are sort of loose and, and so on and so forth. And you could also say that um, so re more recent writers like the science, like the science fiction and fantasy writer China Mieville have pointed out that it's not really mm -hmm. true that if it has technology and it's set in the future, it has it's cognitive. And that if it's set in the past and has imaginary beings like dwarves, then it's non-cognitive. There's again, it, it's fuzzy. There are many different ways of approaching things. So, you know, everybody, all academics around science fiction tend to start with Steuben's definitions, but the more, you, mm -hmm. you know, I'm not, I'm not dissing him entirely, but you know, when you, if you press it far enough, then, it, it gets kind of shaky and you know also things like ideology of political ideologies and these kinds of novels can be more variable you know either it's almost even has either they're good because they question bourgeois capital society or they conform to it or have a nostalgic idea of what came before it and that's bad but again the good and bad and the differences are not as as strict so when I approach science fiction, and I am more interested in what's generally thought of as science fiction than what's generally thought of as, as fantasy, though I like the latter very much also, but um, I'm trying to figure out other ways of talking about these things and, and introduce, using other vocabularies. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's the same dilemma. If you if you make distinctions, then they always, they'll never be entirely right. There'll always be flaws with them. There'll always be things borderline cases, things which contradict them, things which, you know, you can't make an airtight system without somebody being able to say, aha, here's an exception. It fits into this, but it doesn't fit into that. You know, I mean, so I think we have to, we should accept that and, and realize that and, you know, think of rough and ready rules, which are not necessarily airtight or, 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 or totally, you know, consistent. I mean, both the world isn't entirely consistent and neither is our fictions which people write about the world and, you know, in, whether in novels or in, you know, movies and things like that. So I propose a different kind of scheme where I give three, I take three words which have been often used to talk about mm -hmm. science fiction and try to differentiate them and suggest that they form a kind of spectrum. And again, you can't always make an exact differentiation, but there are different examples you can have a different one. So the three words I've glommed onto are extrapolation, speculation, and fabulation. Mm -hmm. okay. So I can say, should I say a little about those? Yeah. Um or, or. Yes, oh, actually, before we get to that, just to foreground it a little bit. Um, yeah, I just want to pick up. So I really liked your point, actually, in the piece, specifically about, you know, 
genres always create a kind of hard boundary which is inherently fuzzy and therefore we yeah. need this you know Wittgensteinian pragmatic view of things it yeah. almost I, seems if like you don't use the, the genres then you have then you don't have any grounds to talk about but if you use them too strictly mm. then you exclude things wrongly and stuff so yeah absolutely i mean it's i'd like to think about in terms of you know you, moving from a sort of a to use like a phrase or kind of a gesture you get from like someone like Deleuze, you know, it's not about what it means in the strict sense of categorization definition, but the functions that science fictional writing and science fictional imagination can uh, enact. And one of the main things I think, you know, that sets you apart from like the souvenist, let's say, tradition, although it's quite interesting how he hates um, fantasy. He was he was very big on mythology at the last uh, mm. Utopian Studies conference. And maybe maybe he's having I a think he may, he's no, pretty old now, but I think he may be softening a little bit. Like, <laughs> Result but, uh, of people I like about... Pipe China Mabel, I think, you know, who've written mm. books which are clearly fantasy and also clearly very Marxist. And so mm. that breaks down <laughs> Suvin's absolute system. Yeah. So. I want to ask about the function that science fiction is is playing in how you're trying to unfold it through these three characteristics. So mainly the function of representation or mimesis. And yeah. if we think about representation as you know something that represents as in standing in for something, yeah. um, what is what is the what is rep, what is represented by science fiction? And even though it's not actual, yeah. what is what is represented by it if it isn't actuality? Okay, yeah, that's a major point in what I'm trying to develop. So, um, you know, this is sort of, the, there's a, the big aesthetic issues here is not just Douglas Stewart. Throughout the 20th century, a lot of artists as well as philosophers and critics have tried to, you know, trash the idea of representation. And I mean, it's very, in a certain way, it's very simple. If you have a picture or a painting, mm -hmm. let's say, a painting looks like something. You see people in it, you see a location in it. Very often painters have made realistic paintings where they, well, that's my dog. I, can, you, can I get him some water or just take one second? Of course, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> okay, sorry, my dog is very vocal. That's, no, that's all right. <laughs> These things are always heavily and tightly edited, but we should probably keep that in. That, that's, yeah, uh, that's lovely. Okay. Well, anyway, so a lot of 20th century philosophy and theory and art has been anti-representational. Um, mm. The picture is not, I mean, if you take a painting, first of all, you have abstract paintings instead of paintings showing landscapes or portraits, whatever, though you still have landscapes and portraits, of course. Secondly, the idea is that it's not reproducing a, a real scene so much as what the artist does with the scene. So like, if you're talking about a painting, it may be a painting of a landscape or a portrait, but a lot of it is what the artist does, how their brush strokes work, um, what kind of colors mm -hmm. they use, how they do a formal design of the canvas. And so the representation is devalued. It's often said that when photography was invented in the 1830s, I guess, that painting was liberated because it no longer had to give pictures of reality, it could do something something else, something more subjective, or not necessarily even subjective, something more formal. A lot of, you know, one big interpretation of the abstract expressionists in the mid 20th century is that the painting isn't about a subject matter, or isn't even about a psychological mood, it's about the constraint, the physical constraints of, of paint on a canvas. <laughs> And, you know, it's not that I reject modernism or I want to go back to the 19th century, but it's that that itself became too big of an ideology, let's say, and made it hard to think about other dimensions. So mm -hmm. um, when you read, there are experimental novels and, you know, starting with Joyce in the first half of the 20th century and mm -hmm. more recently as well, but I mean, even Ulysses, which is a formal experiment in all kinds of ways, is also a portrayal of one one day in Dublin at a particular date and with with particular characters and so on and so forth. So there, mm. even prose, you know, literature prose tends to be representational in that you have characters, you have a location. I mean, often authors in all genres like and in both serious literature and commercial genres like to play with it by creating inconsistencies or creating like an Escher effect of things which, you know, drive you crazy because they deliberately made so as to contradict themselves, but nonetheless, you're still describing a scene. And so most science fiction novels, you know, have characters and a, and a narrative. 
and things happen and and the background is more important than with the naturalistic novel because it's an invented background, not the real background, which we take for granted every day. Mm. So, but I mean, you're not really, it's not, and you may pay attention to the prose, especially starting in the 60s, a lot of science fiction writers paid very much attention to their prose style. I mean, there's a lot of old science fiction and some new ones that all just seems to really written in serviceable prose. It tells you what's happening without being particularly beautiful writing or something like that. But, you know, mm -hmm. starting in the... 60s you had writers like Samuel Delaney and J.G. Ballard and many others who were very concerned with the literary style of what they were doing and how how that worked. So, you know, part of my saying is that I don't, you don't really get away from representation. I mean, as you read it, mm. you're not, especially with a genre fiction like science fiction or other literary genres which are often considered pop rather than art, though again, that's another question because more kind of mainstream literary fiction it picks up science fictional themes in the last 20, 30 years than used to be the case, for instance. And there always is, is 1984 a science fiction novel or is it a high literary novel? Well, it's both in certain ways. And how you approach mm -hmm. it will give you different things, things to look at in it. But okay, so science fiction is portraying fantastic literature. So that includes science fiction, but also fantasy, horror fiction, and various other things are portraying realities which are not meant to mimic the reality that we actually live in day to day. They may be looking at deep undercuts like, you know, we usually don't live in a horror novel, but horror novels may reveal to us the secret, you know, psychological or social mm. conditions which we spend our lives trying to avoid. But nonetheless, so anyway, the point is that you have this representation. In science fiction in particular, the representation is not of the actual world we live in, though it's not completely unrelated. Usually it's not completely unrelated to the actual world we live in. And mm. the way that works is traditionally science fiction is um, deals with technology. So it deals with how the world might be different when different technologies mm. exist. If we could you know, be flying around the solar system in spaceships or if we discovered a way to use worm, wormholes to avoid the speed of light difficulty and get to other planets quickly and all kinds of stuff like that. Mm. Um, or it might deal with things like surveillance technologies. You know, um, some science fiction, I'm reading a new novel now by Cory Doctorow, who often writes about very current kind of technological. So the new novel I'm reading, I just started it, but it's about cryptocurrency, which is a big thing in Silicon mm. Valley and among a lot of rich people. But problematic in various ways, which he's clearly trying to bring out in the novel. So, I mean, they're different, they're different degrees of how close it is and how far away it is. But my argument is that, again, this is something which you always find acceptance to, but that my argument is that the basic, the best way to think about science fiction is, is that what is it, what is it on basis of, what is it representing? It's not representing the world as we live it today. It's representing the world as we could live it in a future time when we either, I mean, usually it means more advanced technologies, which change our daily experience. Sometimes it's like after a nuclear holocaust, so it's much less advanced technology, but it's still the difference between a post-nuclear holocaust novel and a novel set in, you know, 20,000 years ago is that the one set in the future, it's things have been ruined by this holocaust. It's not the same as that the technology hadn't been invented yet. So what I try to think about and what the premise of my book is, is that science fiction is depicting something which I call futurity. So futurity is not the same as the actual future. Science fiction writers always say they're not predicting what's going to actually happen. And if you can see ways in which things are, some things are predicted, you can also see lots of ways that other things aren't. So, I mean, you know, people say that the tricoders, they, they carry on Star Trek starting in the 1960s are like cell phones before cell phones were invented. Mm -hmm. That's kind of true, and all, both in the way that they communicate and the way they do all kinds of other things like phone, like our phones do today, but mm -hmm. that's not the main point of it. I mean, you know, the main point is much more important for sending aside a galactic society which different races and species and ethnicities, et cetera, do get along, but there are certain types of issues which result mm -hmm. from consistent problems of human nature or whatever. So, you know, I mean, there's, so science fiction in my, my I try to define a way that science fiction deals with futurity. And what future, what I have, the way I define futurity is not what's gonna actually happen in the, in, in, the, in the future, but tendencies to change which already exist in the present. So we can talk about the present in terms of actual facts, but really 
the present is more than fact than just facts. I mean, the world is more than just facts. Some philosophers have tried to say the world, you know, early Wittgenstein tried to say the world is, a collection, you know, our discourse is a collection of facts. And, you know, if you have the facts, which are true, you know, but mm -hmm. the point is, there's a lot more than just what you can factually say in the sense that there are potentialities, there are different things which could develop, which might or might not, which are opened up when we have a new technology, like, you know, I mean, we're seeing it right now because we've seen it most of my life. I, I'm 69 years old, so I was born in 1954. So the decade in which I was born was the decade when TV became prominent in the US and other countries, mm -hmm. it was the decade when computers were first being developed, really, and, 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 and stuff like that. So when I was a kid, I wouldn't have imagined any of those things, but we see how these technologies have, tra have transformed things. And now, just like in the last several months, we see this thing with these AI bots, which have achieved a level of sophistication in generating discourse that they never had before. And so we can mm -hmm. start wondering, so futurity might be defined as all the things that could arise from that, but not everything that can arise will, and they're all different reasons why, how they interact. But I mean, science fiction tries to draw out potentialities, things that are latent or incipient in, mm -hmm. in reality, but don't exist yet. And Oh, another way I define that is to think about the difference in the future and the past. I mean, it's like in America, especially, we, you know, Americans don't believe in in things like this. I mean, you know, it's a, it's a clear, I don't know if they have this in the UK or elsewhere, but in America, it's your history. That means you're, you're just the past, you're totally irrelevant, you don't matter anymore. <laughs> but of course, history does matter. And William Faulkner, the Southern novelist of the early 20th century said, the past isn't dead, it isn't even past. I mean. A lot of what we have today is lingering from the past. When something happens, it's part of the fabric of reality as a, as a, as a fast. We may not know the past perfectly. Obviously, we don't. But unless anything has happened, if you think of chains of causes and effect, but you don't have, but it's not simplistic that A causes B causes C. It's that you know, mm. a web of things. We're doing everything that happened in the past is kind of leaves res residue behind because it's part of, the architecture of the world we live in now. So the past still kind of exists. And the same way I'm suggesting it's less definite, but the future also sort of, I mean, the, using word play wordplay, I said the past persists and the future insists. So it's in the same root, the cysts root, what would both persist and insist. It's mm. insist, that means it's not realized itself, but it's sort of <clears throat> pushing, it's a potentiality. And that's another another way to think about it in terms of philosophy is think about how do we define potentialities and possibilities. Is anything I mean, mm -hmm. one some philosophers would say that anything that's not logically contradictory is possible. So I mean, you know, it's if something you can't have a square circle because that's a logical contradiction, but mm -hmm. anything that's not a logical contradiction could happen, you know. We could all turn green in the next three months for on our skin, no matter what race people are. I mean, it's, on the other hand, that that so that's literally possible, but it's not a potentiality because it, I, I just I just don't think it's going to happen. You know, I mean, maybe I could be wrong, but and so you can't exclude anything which is logically possible. But to mm -hmm. think about the better way, to my mind, which some which some thinkers like Deleuze and Whitehead developed in the 20th century, but many philosophers today don't think enough about is how there are certain trends, certain things have more potentiality because there are more things which should lead to them. It's not just a new configuration of the world that is that is not logically inconsistent, therefore it's possible, but that you can think of how things could develop from one situation to another, how you could get from. So ideally, science, and again, I say ideally because there are always exceptions, this is only an approximation. Science fiction would, would deal with things which could develop out of what exists now, even though they don't exist as of yet, mm -hmm. and probably never will exist. So potentiality, futurity, that, that cluster of terms is what I'm thinking science, science fiction is about. And again, it's often not literal. I mean, if you take a, a novel like Dune, he's not predicting mm -hmm. that there'll be this <laughs> substance called spice which will allow people to travel interplanetary distances and it'll be only on one planet, and, you know, but. He's thinking of things like resource use, ecology, different ethnicities, people who are tied to the land, the way the freemen are, which vaguely, you know, like the Bedouins in 
in the Middle East, you know, stuff like that. You know, it's always taking things which sort of exist, but which they're projecting the potentialities of what they, how they could act differently. And that's, I think, what science fiction does. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, I, I do is a great example of this because of, you know, Frank Herbert as a speechwriter think, yeah. and also someone working for a lot of desert ecologists thinking, you know, if this, if these two strands carry on, the heroic worship of the political yeah. and a and the ecological destruction, this is where we're going to end up. But Will, sorry, I just interrupted you. I really had a question. Will, go yeah, for it. Like, I think this question of temporality and semblance is really yeah. important to this notion of mm -hmm. futurity, which, like, seems to be inspired in part by a Bergsonian understanding of time and Craig's not here. So I'm going to yeah. botch, I'm going to botch the Delizzo guitar okay. inception of the virtual, yeah. but the virtual persists in what we could call the actualized mm -hmm. for, for, for Delizzo guitar. -y. And I'm kind of, I'm thinking in a certain sense that science fiction can do in a certain way, uh, can put genealogy on its head, mm -hmm. right? Where if the Foucauldian notion of, of genealogy uh, yeah. is precisely a history of the present, right? Mm -hmm. It understands that the owl of Minerva is never actually done flying, yeah. that the past is not yet ever determined, and the past is never truly passing us or has passed, mm -hmm. that yeah. even the dead are not safe, that if right. there is a people to come, they're not safe, they're nev they'll never be born. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, And it's not a perpetual deferral, but in a certain sense, what what I really appreciate about this is, is it reorients our relationship between speculative fiction and the political in a way that can can give us an account of the present, of the violence of the present, in a way that we could only see it by stepping outside of it, not into the past necessarily, yeah. but but and not neither into the future, but precisely into into these these shattered. Uh, yeah. exterior temporalities because what might happen right is is I, I don't even have a way to say this that like effectively captures what you're up to here but like i like the the very corny way to say it is like what might happen is always informed by what is happening mm -hmm. right so yeah. in, a, in a way right like we we did an episode on um uh i have no mouth and i must scream mm -hmm. right yeah. where where what's fascinating about that that short story is the specificity of of um of uh am the technological specification of like how exactly this computer works yeah doesn't really matter like the video right. game vulgarizes it a little bit because like you can actually move through it and but the in in the actual text i have no mouth and i must scream the particularities don't really matter what's there is an ontology of the cold, a political ontology of the Cold War, and our epistemology of the present. Right? Yeah, like we are already in the belly of Anne. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's what I I think is is really so. When you talk about futurity, like what what does speculative fiction? So so it is this intervention into the present, and perhaps even an intervention into the past. Yeah. How exactly can what and of course like asking a theorist oh what are what are the upshots of your work right is always yeah. a dangerous question well, but like what tools do you hope to provide us in such a way that we can produce a rupture in capitalist temporality um like you know what what you know what are what are my, you know i'm handed this hammer what should i be trying to shatter mm -hmm. right um so that's the question i don't know okay no that's a great question and it encompasses a lot of what i'm trying to think about so but um i don't think i have any answers to, to that question but um i think i'm doing a bunch of things which are which are related to i mean there are two cliches about science fiction one is that it's showing us the future the other is that science fiction is really about the present in which it's written not about the future which is set and those are both partly true you know, like most cliches, they have a lot of truth in them. Kim, the American science fiction writer Kim Stanley Robinson says his analogy, which I quote some places, that it's like when you see 3D glasses and to see a 3D movie. So he's saying one lens goes looks at the present, the other lens looks at the future, and somehow the coalescence between them creates a different, a three-dimensional picture. So, you know, and Robinson is somebody who's very obviously interested in social change. I mean, his last novel, um, Ministry for the Future, which is really good, it's 
it's it's about science fiction in its most kind of nerdiest and techiest, but it's really smart. It it's sort of like it creates a, a near future in which there's a UN organization which is has a certain power to change how things go, and he goes through all these different technologies and different different attempts, ranging from you know very you know techy kind of technological fixes to at least, at least implicitly terrorism against the worst offenders in terms of destroying the environment and everything possibly in between. And he comes out with a novel which is surprisingly optimistic because it actually suggests that if we did all these things, then climate change might be mitigated and we might still have a livable earth in 50 years from now. I mean, you could also read the book as very pessimistic because the likelihood of all the things he predicts happening actually happening are pretty slim, which means that we're really, really screwed. But um, all the things he says are, they are extrapolations. They are, you know, based on what exists now. In other words, these are all things which could happen, which are pretend, they are actual pretend, they are, they're not actual, but they are potentialities which exist in our present. And so, and and so, you know, that is one thing that science fiction does very well. He does it maybe more literally than some other writers do. But, I mean, compared to, say, Herbert's Dune as, as a kind of ecological fable. But, but nonetheless, you know, it is a way of thinking about or intervening in how the, the relation of the present to the future. Um, so I see it as a kind of inverse of Foucault's genealogy. If, if, if Foucault's genealogy is about things from the past which haven't disappeared, but which are still present in various ways in the present. Science fiction can be about future, future, future potentialities that already are latent or incipient in the present, but and which other things could happen happen with. So it's like going a genealogy. It's like a genealogy of the future instead of a genealogy of the past. We like the Foucauldian genealogy. It's actually telling us a lot about the present because we don't have any other reference point. But it's expanding our awareness, either for, both for good and for ill, because obviously dystopian science fiction novels are included here too, of what could develop out of what what exists and what things we may not notice, but actually could turn into powerful forces. And that's why it's not, it's a lot of it's technological, but it's not just technology. It's also political, social, economic, et cetera, things, obviously. So. I think hammering on the idea that it's not just technology is 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 incredibly important, especially I mean, even just thinking about. I mean, yeah, we're on zero. We yeah, occasionally we should probably bring up Mark Fisher at some point because mm -hmm. his his one of his great examples in the beginning of capitalist realism is is children of men, and yeah. uh, I think it gives such a great example of extrapolation because. Uh, well, it's yeah. the first, of course, extrapolation is the listeners yeah. is the first characteristic of the mechanisms of science fiction that Stephen is, is pointing out. But yeah. the there was there was an interview with Alfonso Cuaron, the director, and he he said, yeah. "Look, I was writing this in two thousand and five, and I thought, you know, what would things be like if they just kept going on as they are?" Mm -hmm. And the, the the dominant joke in the UK is that yes, things are things have turned out like that uh mm -hmm. within about two years difference for example um <laughs> there's complete infertility of political imagination bex hill is a militarized refugee concentration camp or being offered up as one yeah it's it's bad I mean, but let's, let's actually use that to get into the, these three mechanisms here because okay. of course we have the it's, it's extrapolation but we also have uh, speculation and fabulation but i guess to, to start off could we yeah. distribute uh, distinguish the extrapolation versus speculation, because I think sometimes people might get them yeah. mixed up in some well, again, I mean, I mean, yeah, I'm yeah. taking terms which have been widely used and which have been divergently defined mm. and saying, well, I'm not saying this is the truth and everybody else is wrong. Mm. I'm saying this is a useful way to think about these terms in ways they can be useful as sort of mm. different degrees. Well, extrapolation, I mean, ex extrapolation is the most straightforward because I mean, it's mathematical meaning is, you know, a mm. line graph, you extrapolate meaning you continue it past the point you've reached so far and assume mm. that things will be going in the same direction just more. And that's obviously something which a lot of science fiction does. Um, I also related to certain ideas about how scientific experimentation works because it's sort of like, mm. um, and scientific experimentation, you kind of try to isolate one mechanism and which might not happen mm. in the real world because there's so many other mechanisms going on at the same time, but you try to isolate this one thing and see what happens as it carries out. And so a lot of science fiction novels do that kind of thing. They say, you know, I mean, there's a famous, there's a famous phrase and I don't, 
It's been attributed both to Isaac Asimov and to Robert Heinlein, two of the classics, so golden age science fiction writers of the 40s, 50s, 60s. And, but, and so I don't know which one of them really said it, though I said one of them must have, but it's, it's that science fiction is not predicting cars like in the 19th century, it's predicting traffic jams. So it's not just the invention, it's what the invention leads to. So mm. obviously by, nine, by the time whoever it was who said this, there already were traffic jams, but, um, but that, that's the point. Could, you, could people have imagined that when they just imagined, you know, a mechanized form of transportation which didn't need horses for or something like that? Yeah, it's um, like uh, in a certain sense it's informed by Virilio's ontology of the accident, mm -hmm. right? Yeah where i mean virilio doesn't have the same relationship to futurity that i think you do no um where where for virilio it really is a kind of historical a historical problem and i think deleuze does a good job of i guess provide <laughs> providing an account of virilio that can play well with genealogy because yeah. i know that virilio really does try Mm -hmm. throughout his work to distinguish himself from genealogy but i, I think yeah. that sees the fundamental problem in that so i really i really appreciate this this notion of of a genial a genealogical approach flipped on its head mm -hmm. um, my question then becomes what happens when a referent is speculative right where a point of reference loses loses its uh Oh, God, I'm going to misuse this word, so I'm sorry yeah. to all my grad school professors. Mm -hmm. It's facticity. What happens well, when it loses its... its, it's well, again, form? you know, it, again, there are different degrees. I mean, when I say that science fiction is representational, it means that, you know, most narratives, even if they're in these fantastical circumstances with, you know, intergalactic travel and stuff like that, it's trying to give us specific incidents and specific... I mean, it's that's what makes a science fiction novel different from, you know, a futurist... I mean, there are many inter there are interesting people writing futurism saying, here are the trends which could happen. But when you make it a narrative and have specific characters and stuff like that, that gives it a kind of facticity, which a more general thing couldn't, couldn't do. But um, when I go from extrapolation to speculation, which I think is what you're asking about, it's, it becomes less tethered to actuality and less, I mean, an extrapolation is, I mean, it's pretty clear that if, you know, certain trends continue and or and the and the you know carbon emissions in the atmosphere continue as I mean it's sort of like people were concerned with this when I was like a teenager a little bit but you know it's sort of like it was always ignored and then you know 20 or 30 years ago people started getting really concerned about it and now it's very present in all discourse but they're still not actually doing anything about it we're still increasing carbon emissions at a untenable rage you know even if we st i mean it's estimated that even if we stop now there would be like a two degree celsius rise in temperatures by the end of the century but it's in fact we're not stopping at this rate where it's, 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 it's accelerating I mean, it's, but anyway but the point is um at some point you get beyond extrapolation things become too crazy i mean it's sort of like um this fits in with all kinds of ideas like um you know complexity theory and chaos theory that there's certain points or singularities at which the behavior totally changes is no longer linear. So the scientific analogy would be, you know, you can say what happens to water, you know, linearly, but when it gets to boiling point, it changes to something else. And so you have a kind of discontinuity or, or a transformation and that can't be extrapolated. That requires other types of information and it's no longer a kind of linear progression, but a qualitative change in something else. Now, I mean, I'm not trying to talk about this necessarily in the way scientists do, but just as a metaphor, it's kind of, so I think of speculation as science fiction, which pushes beyond extrapolation because it is um, doing additional, it's, it's, it's going to additional dimension. It's making a jump. It's making a quantum leap or it's making a jump beyond just sort of linear progression into, into that at some point when it turns into something else entirely. And of course, there are various ways we can imagine that. And the, the two analogies, I use two analogies, speculation in philosophy and speculation in economics and finance. So in philosophy, speculation is like Kant in the late 18th century said, we cannot speculate. We this is stuff we can know, and when we go beyond that, we get into nonsense because we start making all this kind of crazy metaphysical theories, which, which, which lose track. But ever since Kant, people have been trying to think: Is there a way we can actually get beyond Kant's limits without just violating 
things in the way that Kant would have scorned. And you might say that all philosophies, Western philosophy since Kant, starting with Hegel and then going on to the 20th century, involve attempts to do that, to push beyond, to see a qualitative transformation and therefore to be speculating about something in ways that, um, strictly speaking, you shouldn't be allowed to do, but that you kind of do it in a kind of sneaky and experimental way, which allows you to sort of push beyond the boundaries. And I gave the example I gave for that in my, in my, in my manuscript in progress is she said, Qi Xin Liu's um, trilogy of novels, the Chinese science fiction writer, trilogy of novels, Remembrance of Earth Past, which it starts in a very local situation and becomes more cosmic by the end. So it starts out in the Chinese Cultural Revolution in the late 1960s and, and talks about very specific things happening then. But then it gets into messages from aliens from another solar system, and then the aliens are invading Earth. So that'll take hundreds of years because they have to travel well below light speed. And then you know, by the end of the third volume, it's totally cosmic, and we're talking about the basically the end of the universe and a new Big Bang, which might start things anew, totally, you know, like shaking the dice and starting everything all over again, but without any possibility of knowing the outcome. So he's sort of, he's speculative. He goes, he starts from actual social political situations, extrapolates those social and political exaggerations to relations between Earth and other planets instead of just just countries within the Earth. And then goes beyond that, gets more and more kind of mind blowing and cosmic. And that's a kind of tendency. It's when one tendency in science fiction, which dates back at least dates back at least to Olaf Stapleton in the 1930s and 1940s, where these kind of speculative histories of different species of humans going on for millions and millions of years into the future on different planets and stuff like that. Um, it's so I mean science fiction is a fine is a way of thinking about these kinds of issues and thinking about possibilities of vast changes in ways that still mm -hmm. somewhat reality based but it goes beyond it speculates to the limits of what we can imagine and to the limits of what we're capable of in ways that have philosophical import okay so that's half of it the other half is speculation in finance i mean it's very hard to not talk about speculation in finance since our current late capitalist or whatever you want to call it system is so massively mm -hmm. based on the financialization of everything I mean, it's sort of like when you read that automobile, I live in Detroit, the center of the U.S. automobile industry. And of course, there's a whole history of that from dominating the world to losing out to other parts of the world and and downsizing and employing a lot less people. And that's had a big effect on sort of the on on the city of Detroit and its relation to the world. And it's I mean, I just read one of the repeater books by Joe Malloy about the history of Detroit music. Mm is great on on that he's seeing how the music is imagining things related to what was happening politically socially economically in Detroit but um the point is that now everything becomes a subject of speculation kind of it's why I mean it, it blew my mind when I read that actually General Motors and Ford make more money from their loan business than from the car business like it's money they make is not from selling you the car but right from, from giving you a loan to purchase the car I, it's it's mm. that's kind of really disturbing <laughs> if you think about it. But I mean, speculation is attempt. Speculation finance is attempt. You know to give everything a price, including things that you can't know. So there's certain things mm. you can. I mean, we have statistics. We have it's like insurance, life insurance, and things like that. We know a certain percentage of things will happen a certain percentage of time. It'll, after five years, so many cars. So this percentage of these cars will have will need new transmission, whatever, you know, but there, but it goes beyond that to a level where you have things which are totally incalculable, which have now become subject to speculation, which they've just tried to just to create mathematical formulas for which they can, you know, make money no matter what happens. I mean, when you talk about hedge funds, hedging originally means, you know, if the word putting your bets in opposite ways so that even if something you don't expect happens, you still don't lose over money. But at this point, hedge funds are just wildly speculative and they're just, you know, they're both basically putting, placing bets on things which seem ridiculous or in or extremely unlikely, but also they they collapse and they, these you know these you know collapses we have like in two thousand and eight result because um, things happen which don't can't be made sense of in the ma mathematics and therefore they don't they don't provide for so I mean and but that sort of has to do with the fact that almost everything in life is being more and more a subject of speculation so I mean I talk in in the book I talk about for instance you know science fiction stories which reflect this like you know there's a particular short story I write about which is about having 
you know, speculation markets and people's future earnings prospect. Mm. So, you know, I can't send my kids to college because it's too expensive. So they take out bonds and, you know, their their college education is paid for by this these loan company, which then sees a certain percentage of their salary for the rest of their, their lives to as a form of paying back. Um, you know, if you think, I mean, that's very scary, but it's also all, not all that far from what's already happening. You know, I mean, it's... I mean, I've got those loans. That's what the UK yeah. system is. I've got that loan. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. But, you know, so so the, the story I write about just puts it a little further. Well, well, you know, if you're going to lose a lot of money, you might as well liquidate it right now by killing the person who, who's who's turned out to be a, boor, a poor investment because they didn't earn as much money. Or short of that, you can imagine, well, okay. I decide, I, mm. I get my education paid for this way and I have these loans, but I mean, it's sort of like, I'm supposed to pay back my my salary, but I decide I really don't want the high pressure business job. I want something which is much more, you know, enjoyable and more peaceful and pays a lot less, but it's enough for me. Then you can imagine the company, the loan company suing you and saying, you're not giving us, you, you cannot take that job. You have to take the high pressure for that job instead because otherwise we're not getting our investment. I mean, if you just, I mean, none of, so this is exaggerating what's actually happened, but it's not all that much of an exaggeration when you think of the way in which these financialized logic mm -hmm. has, yeah. has. And then so speculation is both about trying to profit from whatever happens and about thinking about wilder and stranger and less likely prospects instead of, it's sort of, it's a change. There, there's a American philosopher, Robin James, who's been writing interesting stuff about mm -hmm. this. She writes about how, you know, we we're, there's a change in the logic and this has to do with mathematics and, and philosophical orientation but it's, it's business practice from probabilism which is like you have the bell curve and you know what's most likely and what the mm -hmm. statistics are to possibilism where it's things which might seem extremely unlikely but nonetheless are possible and sort of speculating on those as well and again it's a way it's, it's part of it's a hedge idea if you bet on different things simultaneously then no matter what happens you won't lose all your money you might gain some money but also it's a way of manipulating things in order to have these, it destabilizes, it creates more extreme out, outcomes because that's a way that more money will be able to be extracted. I mean, it's, you know, I mean, I don't, I'm not good enough at math and economics to understand all the ramifications of this, but it does seem to be something that's happening. And so science fiction speculation, I think has to be thought of in relation to this kind of way. We live in a society where more and more speculation drive, mm -hmm. speculation more and more drive, instead of facts, more and more drives the way corporations behave and the way we're forced to, you know, therefore behave also. So, you know, so I'm trying to speak. I mean, there are a lot of things I can say in speculation. We talk about particular novels and how they speculate, but I think mm -hmm. the climate of speculation, both in the philosophical and the economic sense, are both so central to how the world works right now that science fiction is sort of adapting and hopefully mutating this, this, this methodology. I mean, I, I, mean, I love the story you was referencing. Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. I just love. I really like love the story. Is referencing overvalued because it also yeah. gives me one of the favorite lines of that chapter, which is there is no better. Ex I, I love this line you wrote. There is no better example of science fiction speculative grasp upon futurity than the way in which it can function as anterior parody. And I particularly like how you mm. focus on the difference between speculation, which, as you said, is always hedging against yeah. the future, versus mm -hmm. speculation, which is. Uh, to to use a phrase which is somewhat outdated for softly now, maybe accelerating the process because we haven't yeah. seen anything yet. Right. But, uh, Will, right. sorry, I know you wanted. To, I know you had a question as well. I just wanted to tee you up there and also mention no, not, about this, <laughs> this this story. Not really. Yeah. I just think like um, like feed forward cybernetics, like the story about the Rand Corporation, right, and yeah. the machine that spit out when mm -hmm. the war in Vietnam was going to end. Yeah. And in 1969, it spit out that the war ended in 1967. <laughs> um, you know, what's, what's kind of, um, what's kind of interesting and like, what's helpful. <laughs> I keep thinking to myself, you know, uh, the way in which we understand human capital is a series of, of capacity for capacities, abilities, and, and decisions made. Yeah. Um, and, or at least that's the way Gary Becker puts it, right? Mm -hmm. And Schumpeter yeah. also a little bit earlier with the notion of innovation kind of lurks mm -hmm. in that, yeah. in what would become a neoliberal, hyperliberal understanding right. of the individual within the market. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, but in a certain sense, I want to flip that and be like, well, if the Department of Education, <laughs> uh, the Department of Education should have made a much better bet than giving me $30,000 to <laughs> study philosophy at Duquesne, right? Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> like yeah. they should just be more responsible. They're not getting mm -hmm. that back. <laughs> 
like no, but they're not, you know i think they they assume they'll get it back first of all they'll enslave you for the rest of your life it's oh, like yeah. they'll, they'll you know they'll, they'll get it back to my i mean the idea is that no matter what it's you can see that as a hedge bet but it's also you know a way of you know controlling the future yeah for sure and like i think I mean, that if it, you're constrained by having to pay back debts i mean i'm trying i i went to school a very long time ago I'm, since I'm almost 70 now and so i you know i had a few debts and i paid them back but now my kids are going to college and i'm worried i'm trying to keep them free from debt but that means basically going to my own retirement savings which you know i've been saving for 30 40 years in the hope that I'd still have an income when I when I when I retire, which will probably do in the next year or two. But you know, it's so it's just bizarre. Well, it's but, a remarkable you know, yeah. tool to keep. Like debt is, and <laughs> this is in this is in Foucault's uh, yeah. society. Debt is a remarkable technology of discipline. Yeah, I mean, definitely, and I mean, it's also William Burroughs in one of his later books, Cities of Red Night. He talks about how 18th century writers would try to write themselves out of debt. Like the only thing you could do to make money was to write. And so you just scribble as fast as possible and turn in as many pages as possible in order to get paid so you can pay off your debts. So Burroughs says, what I want to do now in the late 20th century is write my way, way out of death instead of out of debt. You can make punny on the similarity of the words. And if I can write enough, I can make myself immortal, but it doesn't work, you know, so. Well, I, I could pull on that Burroughs for it because I've been on a massive. I mean, Burroughs is such a fascinating figure in terms of the control yeah. society and extrapolation. But yeah. let's. I know we're coming up now. Let's 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 tackle that the third horn of the mechanism of science fiction. So so fabulation. So you, you described yeah. it as so like. The self, as it quotes, you know, the self-conscious reduction of fictions that know themselves to be fictional and that mobilize this fictionality in some way, you know, usually against the the actual world. So, can we unpack this definition of fabulation? Because I know it's, it's yeah. a term I, I mostly know from Deleuze is what is philosophy, but I gotta admit, it's still it's still something I, I, I honestly struggle with. Is, is it basically like fables, fabulating? Well, like fables, I, it's, fabling? It's, it's, it's complicated because there are multiple genealogies and people use the words in different ways. Okay. Um, Deleuze is getting it from Henri Bergson, and Bergson mm. uses the word fabulation in French, which is a more normal French word than it is an English word. And in fact, the translations mm. of Bergson translated don't translate it as fabulation. They have other things like storytelling or myth making or things like that. But um, Bergson sees it as a kind of psychological projection, which can which can mm. say he gives the example of a woman who rang for the elevator, she opens the elevator door and there's, the elevator's not there, so she show if she actually stepped in, she'd fall to her, you know, through the shaft to her death, mm. somehow hallucinates that there's something there preventing you from going in so she doesn't do it. And that's a bizarre example, but I mean, it's sort of like, um, so for me, this step after speculation, which is still, you know, gambling on or speculating in a philosophical way or gambling on in an economic way, how transformations occur is just, you know, creating something which you know is fictional, but which is able to tr transform things. So, I mean, it's still mm -hmm. future oriented in the sense it's taking futurity and sort of suggesting here's not, not this is the trend, but here's how maybe we might be able to shape it to make it different to, you know, mm -hmm. setting up fables. I mean, I, I'll tell you, I've been thinking recently about chat gpt and these other recent just in the last few months mm. bots which can sort of answer in a normal language discourse but it's been noted that they have lots of they, they say a lot of tell a lot of lies or they make up a lot of crap and stuff like that <laughs> i mean i several friends of mine have asked chat gpt about themselves and they were they told so and so used to be a professor at blah 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 but they died in 2019 I mean, I've known like two people who already have gotten that the information they were dead. Mm. So when I did it myself, I didn't get the information that I was dead, but I got the information that um, it talked about, you know, it, it's got some details right and some details wrong. It talked about, you know, that I was a professor and that I told her about cultural studies and it listed has titles mm. of my books. But then it said, Shavero is also a musician and a composer and has released several albums of experimental electronic music. Now, I'm not a composer, I'm not a musician, I have very little musical talent, I listen to music a lot, but I cannot, I mean, I'm totally incapable of composing music. And so, I mean, I kind of think, 
I can't think of anything cooler than being like a experimental electronic musician. Mm. Really, the albums, but I am literally incapable of it. I mean, I don't have the musical ability. If if I actually, I can't play any instrument. If I actually figured out one of the you know synthesizing programs on the computer, it would be completely boring and unimaginative because I don't have that kind of musical skill. But you know, so but what? Mm. But then I think, well, what, what what does that mean? And so I mean, it's sort of like, well, maybe there's another there's another line in the multiverse where I actually did get the musical training and I actually am a music, making musical albums. So, you know, and now I'm jealous of my counterpart in, in another thread of the multiverse. Now, again, the multiverse is the kind of thing, I mean, when I read, I've read a lot of physicists talking about multiverse and some of them are skeptical, mm. some of them are gung-ho about it. I tend to be very suspicious about it. I mean, it just, it seems, I, again, I'm not, I don't know enough about science to give you a, a philosophical scientific explanation of why it seems wrong, but it just seems to be a kind of facile thing. I mean, it's like they can't explain why something happened. So they said, well, this it isn't just this has happened. Everything happened, but it's a different universe. So I'm very suspicious of that at the actual scientific or physics doctrine. I mean, even if we're true, there's no way they could ever demonstrate it. So it doesn't fit into the framework of science. It's more metaphysical, and it's not a metaphysics I particularly like because of the fact that, you know, everything, because it, it leaves room for everything. Um, but it's a great science fictional kind of tool. I mean, so many science fiction writers, mm -hmm. novels use a multiverse conception just as a way to suggest the same character with different circumstances, how people will change by different mm -hmm. events. And so, so, so yeah, I'm kind of say, yeah, I, in some other multiverse strand I am, I did learn music to be, I did have musical talent and didn't quit piano lessons at age 10 and, you know, went on and, and now I'm making this electronic experimental electronic music. How cool. I mean, you know, who wouldn't mm. want to be, you know, do the kind of stuff that, you know, Stockhausen did or that Arca does or something like that. Mm. I mean, you know, mm. but so, I mean, that's, that's sort of how chat GPT and these other large language models sort of do a very simple version of fabulation. It still isn't very good for the most part. I mean, like the suggestion coming up about me, I mean, another one of the chat uh, of the LLMs I asked about myself listed some books I had written, and several of the titles were correct, but they also listed one of Frederick Jameson's books as something I had written. And I said, oh, that would be cool if I could be, a, I mean, I'm not as smart as Jameson, and I, you know, he's, his books are much, you know, do much more than anything I do, but uh, whoa, it would be really cool if I could have written Jameson's books. But, you know, the point is, that is a kind of fabulation, though it's a kind of degree zero, a very low level fabulation, but, mm. Fabulation, I'm thinking of as more, I mean, it's it's self-consciously fictional, but it's still related to extrapolation, speculation that it's taking, it's trying to project plausible developments from what actually exists and plausible transformations of what exists. So, I mean, it's sort of like you really can't think of political change of, you know, getting out of capitalist realism without engaging in fabulation. Yeah. Fabulation uh, shouldn't be totally ungrounded. It should have some relation to what exists, but it should push it in very different directions. Yeah, I should I should interrupt here with a small polemic. Your reading of Deleuze is too good for you to have written Jameson's books. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, I, no, I, 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 I prefer my reading of, of Deleuze to Jameson, but there are many other things I admire about Jameson, even when I disagree with him. I think he's, he's clearly a major mm -hmm. thing thinker oh. from in, in the theory writing in the last 15 years. So I have high respect oh. for James. I always agree with him. And I think I had to get it in there. I'm sorry. Well, you know, I mean, yeah. Deleuze, we, I, mean I, love, I love Deleuze, but in recent years, I've been more interested in Whitehead than Deleuze. I mean, Whitehead is, is this kind of strange figure who was a big philosopher in his day, was mostly forgotten, except from these crazy theologians. But Deleuze mm. was interested in, but didn't say much about him. and. Isabel Stengers, the Belgian philosopher who is very close has written a lot, is one who's really reintroduced thinking about Whitehead in the 21st century. And she led me to, to look at Whitehead. And Whitehead is not the same as Deleuze, and I don't want to squish them together too much, but they have, they are, have similar lines of thought which are diverge from the more mm -hmm. consensus views in, in contemporary thought. And so... I'm always thinking about it's what was like, that more maybe more whitehead at this point than Zillow's. Hmm. Well, but if we could think about because I really like we talk about fabulation as essentially it, it's not quite a programmatic aspect of it, but it definitely feeds into absolutely these kinds of fiction, and we've seen kind of a boom yeah. recently in this kind of fiction. I'm just thinking about 
uh, the utopian sort of it's weird there's, there's a new one actually uh yeah. it's called everything for everyone an oral history of the new york yeah, uh, so commune, 2052 really to 2072 yeah. emmy o'brien and, 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 and i mean that's, yeah, that's, that's grounded in political realities and how they could change but i guess i would mm. call it more fabulation than speculation because mm. it goes further than mm. a, i mean you know it's like Kim Stanley Robinson's New York 2104, whatever the book is, it's a novel about New York in the future mm. when it's, when a lot of Manhattan's in the water is spec is speculation, but that book is actually fabulation mm. because it's, it's pushing things, th things further. And also I mentioned Carl Neville um, novels before. So it's sort of yes. like you have Desolation Row, which is just, it's a near future extrapolation where things get a little worse than they are, mm. but not, on a, but but not worse in some ways we can't imagine this is logically happening and then eminent domain takes the same thing goes has a bifurcation point back in the 1980s i guess and leads to a very mm. different outcome which is utopian but not flawless which is part of what i like about it so much um and but it's but it's sort of yeah, some of the same characters in the in the two books as you know the same thing same people developing under different social circumstances so Fabulation, so, I guess, making alternatives is, yeah, it, that, that so, is one way of saying it. Yeah. Uh, so I know I know we're up to it. In that case, I've just got. I'll have I'll, I'll have one more question, and then, uh, and then, and then we'll, we'll let you go. But uh, there's um, I, one one of the books. Uh, so I know you've also written quite a bit about accelerationism, which is kind of one of those interesting sort of collapse ways in which the these. You know, cyber theory collapses the science fictional into yeah. the fictional and i'm wondering so, wh where would you see like accelerationism in terms of a, co a continuum of science fictional thinking or has it sort of completely just exploded the bounds does it does it become something no, that's irrelevant to science fiction you know does no, it, I I, does it I, I mean, try to eliminate the aspect of it i wrote a very short book about accelerationism but i saw it as mm. a kind of i mean i think i say in the book mm. it's the bastard child of science fiction and marxism so mm. it's sort of like i mean again accelerationism i'm not you know i find it intriguing i wrote a lot about it i'm not i wouldn't say i'm an accelerationist and i though i do think you know there's a difference between say left accelerationists and nick land right-wing accelerationists but it's yeah. sort of like you know a lot of what marx writes about is about tendencies and mm. you know he talks about the potential for the rate of profit and mm. it's he mean, I mean, my understanding is that it means something. I mean, a tendency is a is like what I'm talking about, potentiality or futurity. It's an mm. actual, it's, it's an actual trend or tendency or possibility which exists in the situation now. But it doesn't. It's not a, pre, a deterministic prediction because there are also countervailing forces, things that go in other ways, and reality is very complicated. So accelerationism, thinking of it as a food experiment, it's you know, can we in this in this day and age of financialization and you know, ruthless hyper exploitation and the entry of capitalism beyond mm. the workforce to 24 seven lives. Is there a way that we could still think of this as in a mark in this, in the sense of like how Marx thought and hoped for that this could lead to internal mm. contradictions which make it fall apart and lead to something better as opposed to just catastrophe. Mm. And I don't know whether that, that's, that's, that it, it, that, that it, that's an actual possibility, but it's, again, it's a way, it is a kind of science fictional way of, 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 think, of thinking about stuff. And so, I mean, when I wrote that, that book is a very short book, but I, it, I had a, I talked about a few science fictional texts as illustrations. Um, so like one of them was this short story by Paul DeFilippo, an American science fiction writer in which Earth is mm -hmm. obliterated by these monstrous things from outer space, which are like the size of moons and just consume everything. But human beings genetically tailor themselves to sort of exist as parasites in 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 in, in, the, in the bowels of these space-faring enormous beasts. And it's a very clever kind of thing, and it's kind of wistfully humanistic. But it suggests you know talks about all the changes which humans had to do to our to our gene genetics in order to fit this new environment of inside these monsters instead of on a, on a planet. And, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's, so it's, it's like, I don't know, it's interesting because uh, traditional Marxist um, metaphor is that, you know, capitalism is like power workers create wealth, but capitalists parasitically 
consume it. But here, it's like a deliberate inversion of this. I mean, it's the destructive forces of capital like have completely obliterated the universe, but there are ways that we can survive by parasitically, you know, taking something back from it. So, I mean, and the whole, the whole metaphor of, of, of parasites is, is interesting this way. I'll just mention this is completely association, but there's a great movie, which I don't think has been, I've seen with English subtitles, it's a German movie, which came out in Germany a year or two ago, which hasn't been shown in the US yet. I mean, there are distribution issues. I don't know if it's known in these. It's called Bloodsuckers or Blutsauger in German. It's about, it literalizes the Marxist metaphor that capitalists are like vampires. Um, so it's, it's ba it takes place in the 1920s, though it's cheerfully anachronistic and showing, you know, not reproducing the time. But anyway, it's about, it's about a Russian actor who starred as Trotsky in Eisenstein's October. But then we've mm -hmm. never, seen, if you watch Eisenstein's October, you don't see any, any Trotsky. And it's because Stalin ordered all the Trotsky cut out. Um, so this is the actor who thought he'd become famous for playing Trotsky in October, but then his parts of the world cut out. He comes to Germany and just gets, um, mm -hmm. you know, gets involved with these various people and the leading person gets involved with and sort of falls in love with is this woman who's kind of aristocratic background but owns factories. And it turns out that she's literally a vampire. And he just, and then the movie just plays with that, with that trope in all sorts of ways. It's a delightful movie. I hope it gets shown in the English speaking world. So. That is a, a beautiful gothic Marxist Marxist note to end it. Yes. To be honest, because that is I, the the gothic in Marx. Marx Marx doesn't mm -hmm. get the credit for being as much of a goth as as a. Uh, Some people as, have written about really it, but that's what just could be. I agree. Oh God, I, I can't. I can't. Uh, okay, I'm going to have to plug it. Uh, Upcoming soon, repeater capitalism, a horror story on gothic Marxism. That is a, an amazing tie in. Um, speaking about sci fi, Anti Oculus, our book on cyberpunk and how it supervenes on the present. It's going to be awful. Uh, not, no, not, not the book. The cyberpunk is awful. I'm going to edit that out. Sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry, Craig will have to. Sorry, Craig. Um, but in the meantime, uh, Stephen, uh, where can people where can people find you? I know you have a blog where you can link that down. Uh, blog, of course, we have discognition, but I think you have another book more recent than that, haven't you? Yeah, I've been well. I've been doing books. I basically mm. I've recently been writing books on two subject matters. One is science fiction, and mm. the other is music videos. And you know, my background is IT. I'm a professor of film studies. I'm interested in music mm. videos, and so. Here, let me see if I can, I can find them. Okay, so I don't know if you can tell me if you can see this because I can't see my own. So this is Extreme yes. Relations, which is my last, most recent science fiction book. Came out about two years ago, and it's about a number of science fiction texts. It talks about ideas about life and society. So it's not as focused as this cognition, but it's a similar type of thing. And the other most recent book is called The Rhythm Image, which is. Um, my contribution to Deleuze has the movement image and the time image. And there've been about half a dozen mm. people who've suggested a third type of image from more recent cinematic or post-cinematic stuff. And so the rhythm image is my contribution to this. Um, so, but it's, it's most, I mostly don't talk about movies, but about music videos. Mm. And so, I mean, it's sort of, I mean, one way I sometimes define what I'm doing is that, uh, Science fiction is conservative in form, but radical in content, because of being about futurity in various ways. Music videos are conservative in form because it's the same old, you know, <laughs> love and hate that pop music's had for a century, but it's, but it's radical in form because it's doing all kinds of experimental things with cinematic form, which you can't really do in a full length narrative film because you're too much constrained by having to stick to the narrative but which, you know, some music videos are narrative, some aren't at all. They all do kinds of things with editing and with camera movement and stuff, which you couldn't do in a narrative film. So those are the two types of experimentation I'm looking at in my work. Currently, I'm trying to write a longer book about mm -hmm. science fiction, which is what, what, uh, what I, the text I sent you, which these questions are based yeah. on this first chapter. And we'll see when I finish that, but then, you know, that'll be hopefully my next thing to get published once I finish writing it, which I still have to do. Well, what we've read Looking of it forward is to remarkable. Oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. No, I mean, we're looking, we're looking forward to it. Hopefully, can have you back on uh, again, actually, because I, I, I want to read Extreme Fabulations, because that just looks, mm. it looks beautiful. It looks like one of those, like, pulpy, like, uh, prog rock 
sort of slightly yeah, they had a, they, sort of they, tank. They, they did have a nice like Dune. It's from Goldsmith's oh. breath, as in the as in the university. Old. Um, the old haunt of the of the, of the visual visual cultures accelerationists. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, well, in that case, we'll uh, we'll sign off. We appreciate your support of the imprint and the channel. Subscribe to Zero Books today on Patreon. Your material support helps us to promote a variety of perspectives on the left. Also, discover the many titles, new and old, that Zero has curated. Navigate to any of the links in the show notes to extend your support.